Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where the evil empire has once again invaded our galaxy. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And I do know why you're here. I know you're here because Jason Lube is back in the house. And why wouldn't he be? We had maybe my favorite chat this year back in episode 77. I think we damn near tore the house down with that one. So if you haven't heard that one yet, I'd slather that across your ear holes first and then come back to this one. But like any good sequel, this one stands alone on its own. And you can judge for yourself if it lives up to that first one. Jason is, of course, the author of the recently released John D. and the Empire of Angels. He's also written and edited a slew of other books and teaches magic at his website, magic.me. And he's also the guy who was fresh off a rather entertaining skeptical appearance, which left me with both a chuckle and a reminder of why I no longer listen to that podcast. Anyway, in this episode, Jason and I will be chatting a bit about John Dee's mentors and syncretic beliefs, Dee's interest in cryptography, and if the Anakian tables could be elaborate ciphers. And Jason gets really into this idea of unlocking substrate consciousness with Anakian magic, which is an interesting idea to say the least. So let's slap on our discernment caps and open up our subtle ears and cast this pod off deep into that substrate where nothing, and I mean nothing, is as it appears. Enjoy. Jason Lou, welcome back to the show, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for having me back on again. I really enjoyed the last interview we did, and it's sweet to be back. Definitely, man. Yeah, you were here not too long ago to chat about uh, John D. and the Empire of Angels, right before the book came out, actually. And the most downloaded show I've ever had, no joke. Oh, and really? The most, no kidding. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, on one on. of the most well-received as well. I'm a bit biased, but I'd put it up against any podcast recorded this year about anything. When I listened <laughs> back to it, I, I said, I said, God damn, we channeled something pretty angelic here. So I have to thank you for doing that. But as I said, that was before your book came out. So what's life been like since it came out? I know you've been pretty busy, but how's the book been received so far? Book has been received really, really well. Thanks. For, it's actually on its fourth printing already. So the buzz has been really, really great on the book, and I, I'm really, really excited about that. The, the readers seem to love it, which is the most important thing. You know, that that's the thing that I care most about is, is how the readers are receiving it. And I've been getting some great reviews on Amazon. Two or three people have said that it was a masterpiece on Amazon and then on Goodreads, which I'm super, super touched by. So yeah, it's been, I mean, life's been a blur of, you know, it's same day to day. I mean, just doing podcasts and, you know, trying to, trying to get, keep, keep on top of everything and do as much marketing as I can. You know, I'm my own publicity team. So that's pretty much been my life. Other than that, I've been catching up on Marvel movies, but <laughs> that's about <laughs> it. Yeah. Plenty of those to catch up on, man, for sure. So, And I have to say, you've been doing a great job at marketing yourself and the book because you've been on every podcast that I've listened to for the past, you know, three months. So, you know, kudos to your, your hustle out there as well. And Thank you. Really, the reason why I asked you back is because there was a lot of points that I wanted to touch on the last conversation that we just didn't get to. And I thought just maybe a, a nice follow-up here was in the cards, so to speak. So let's just get right into some questions here, man. So... I want to talk a little bit about Dee's mentors, the people that sort of influenced his way of, of thinking. And you wrote about how he found his primary mentor in a geographer, Gerardus Mercator, a pretty good mentor. For people who don't know who he is, you know, what sort of relationship did Dee have with Mercator? And I guess what was Mercator famous for to begin with? So Mercator is most famous for the Mercator projection, which is the original world map. And the first image of the uh, world that most people see in school, uh, although they've changed map projections a little bit since, actually a lot since, particularly with regards to most famously the size of Africa. Uh, you know, Africa is always undersized on world maps in relation to everything else, which is a point of some political contention, as you might imagine, because Africa is actually gigantic compared to the rest of the world, but it's shrunk on world maps and uh you know that's uh being corrected now hopefully anyways that aside yeah mercator is the person who who st first started doing world maps he was a famous geographer and cartographer d learned uh, a lot of navigational and 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 cartographic material from him but this is in d's early 20s so d of course had to leave england because 
you know, of the prevailing trends in the universities at that time, universities were very, very biased towards the humanities, towards the, the classicism or the study of the classics, which, of course, is the study of the philosophy of uh, Greek and Rome. And the primary concern that people had in the academy at this time was recovering the knowledge that had been lost in the Dark Ages, because for the first time they had gotten texts and, and materials from the East after the Byzantine Empire had been sacked and Constantinople fell to the Turks in the 1400s. Uh, Orthodox priests fled uh, Byzantium and came to the, the, the Medici city-states in the Vatican, bringing with them all of the materials that they could save including a lot of material relating to ancient Greece and Rome and Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and all this stuff. And it was an intellectual feast for Europeans who were starving for this stuff. And so they were, they were contributing all their time at the university level to studying that and resurrecting that knowledge. But Dee was not satisfied with that. Dee was a STEM student, as we might more modernly think of. He was interested in mathematics and hard science and the occult and measurements and and experiment. And that was not as in vogue in, at the university level. We might perhaps even compare it to the, you know, the, the academic world today and the university world today was so very much concerned with, you know, social sciences and deconstruction and things like that. Uh, but D was, you know, he really wanted to know the truth. And in order to do that, he had to go to uh, the Netherlands where he studied at the University of Louvain, no relation to the present author, uh, I think. And he he studied under, yeah, under Mercator. He studied under Guillaume Postel. But the key, the most important thing here is not as much Dee's mentors as the picture of the world that he, he began to piece together. Because you can trace all of Dee's later work back to this period. And the really important thing here is the ideas. So among the ideas that were swirling around in Dee's young head were optics, you know, measuring things with glass, glass instruments, science, hard mathematics, navigation, yes, cartography and geography that he learned from Mercator, and also Hermeticism, Kabbalah, astrology, all of this stuff. But the really critical thing to realize out of all this is that what Dee was learning, what he was putting together on the continent was first and foremost, the information that would he would synthesize and bring back to England in a form that would allow England to begin to make the transition into a naval power. We have to understand at this time, England and Europe were impoverished. They were in famine. They were rolling famines over the last hundred years, particularly in France and the continent. There are records of French peasants starving to death in the fields. People were eating you know, they, they were eating acorns, ground down acorns, uh, the blood and entrails of animals that they could get rather than the meat, anything that was left over. Uh, they were eating grass. They were eating sawdust. And there's some fairly grisly depictions at this time of people starving to death and, you know, dying from uh, starvation based diarrhea. And it was it was a horrific time. And so D was looking around at this and. I think that his soul lit on fire a little bit, to, to be poetic about it. He was looking around at the poverty and the misery and the suffering, and he reacted to it as an alchemist and as a magician, meaning he saw the suffering and he asked himself, how can the suffering be alleviated? What can I do with my advanced knowledge? What can I learn and what can I bring back to people that will allow them to better their lot in life? And that's really the core drive of so many magicians and alchemists or uh, spiritual practitioners, particularly if we look at Buddhism, the Bodhisattva vow of relieving suffering from all sentient beings. This is what D was up to. And so the key is that D racked his, tried to learn everything possible. And this was a time that it was still possible to learn everything, meaning that you could still read all published information. And D did his very best. Of course, his library at this time, ultimately, the, he assembled at Mortlake, was five times the size of Oxford and Cambridge. But Dee had a burning passion. He, he, he looked around at the starvation. He looked around at the misery and suffering back in England and, and 
the fact that people were being burned at the stake under the, the reign of Bloody Mary, the, the Catholic, uh, after Henry VIII split from, split from the continent. Uh, his daughter, Mary, when she came into power, was a Catholic and tried to reinstate Catholic power. And there were pogroms of, of Protestants and dissenters, and they were burned at the stake, filling the, you know, the city squares of England with the, the smell of burning human fat and screams. And, and it, was, it was a horrible, horrible time. And England, of course, was very, very intellectually backwards and superstitious compared to Europe. And so Dee had to flee his own country just to try and look for more light, as the Freemasons say. You know, he wanted knowledge. He wanted the flights of what could be possible with the human intellect, which I think is something that anyone who is an intelligent person or who is engaged in learning not just magic but science or anything, you know, with the, the aim of bettering uh, medicine, you know, bettering the lot of humanity probably would share that opinion, and it's not so different to our modern world today. So this is what Dee wanted. He wanted to learn everything and he brought he synthesized the information first as the information that would allow England to become an empire. And of course, this is what brought England out of that state of poverty. It wasn't alchemy. They wanted what what England wanted, what the crown wanted was to discover the secrets of alchemy so that they could turn lead into gold. But Dee gave them something even better, which was the plan to colonize the new world. And critically, in order to do that, he brought back the, yes, the geographic and cartographic information that he learned from Mercator and other teachers on the continent. He brought back a knowledge of, uh, and that was, by the way, necessary for creating maps and cartographic information necessary to start beginning colonization. He also brought back with him optics, which was, you know, an advanced knowledge of optics, which was critical for things like inventing the paradoxical compass, which is a device he invented, which allowed better navigation by sailors and also uh, would later go on uh, post D thanks to the work of his student, Thomas Diggs to begin making advances in modern astronomy, including more modern telescope designs and things like that. And then of course, mathematics, which is critical and astronomy. Astronomy is also critical for sailors for sailing. And, and then of course, D related it to astrology so first he synthesized it in, in that sense, and he realized that just as Rome had become a world empire by building roads and leaning on the technology of roads, that England could do the same thing, even though that it was so tiny, by leaning on advanced naval capability and leaning on the technology of sailing and ships. And it was Dee's work that gave them an edge. He synthesized it. He learned everything that he could on the continent. He brought it back. He synthesized it. He gave England advanced naval knowledge and capacity, and England had the shipyards, which he pushed, he pushed for, was able to construct the shipyards and had the lumber available and the, the, just the dock, docking area necessary, all the harbors necessary to build fleets far, far faster than Spain could. And of course, they got, so they got a, England got a tremendous leap ahead over Spain, thanks to D, and then of course, Due to uh, England's defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, they had a permanent military victory. The Spanish Armada is, of course, when King Philip amassed his entire navy to go and, and destroy the English navy. They began to approach England in the year 1588. Dee, uh, using his advanced scientific knowledge, observed the Spanish fleet approaching England. And by his knowledge of the weather and calculations, was able to figure out that what was most likely to happen is that a storm was going to come and that the storm would wipe out anything in the water. This is another amazing thing with D. This is one of the most critical turning points of the last thousand years, which again comes down to D. Another one of his many pushes on the, the forces of history. D stood at the harbor, looked out over the approaching Spanish Armada, said that the storm is coming. Don't send the English fleet out to fight them. Just wait, hold back the ships, let the storm come. That's exactly what happened. The storm came in, destroyed the entire Spanish Armada. What was left was, was easily mopped up by the English Navy. And because of that, because of that one scientific calculation based on his learning, D single-handedly turned the course of world history. 
because Spain sent their entire naval capability and it was all destroyed simply by nature. And of course, this was interpreted as an act of God and a sign that God was on the side of the Protestants and not the Catholics and that God or the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vau uh, uh, had acted, uh, had, had intervened to destroy the Spanish fleet. Of course, it was simply Dee's just knowledge of science and nature that allowed England to do that. It was an incredible military victory. Spain never regained that military edge ever for the rest of history. And because of that, England was able to colonize much of New England and the New World, while Spain fell far, far, far behind in the imperial race until the point at which uh, you know they, they simply dropped out of the Age of Empires altogether by the, by the 20th century. And Spain took last place, really, in the more or less, or it fell far behind in the race of uh, European countries to create empires by the 20th century. Spain was also permanently crippled because it was, for most of its economic might, also continuing going forward. It was relying on the gold that it had plundered from the New World as its primary economic store of value, whereas England was much more concerned with building naval capability, colonizing and building networks of trade and things like that, which is uh, over time is a much better way to build what wealth and power than simply relying on a store of gold or store of money, you know, as anyone who studied economics for more than five minutes could tell you. So it, that was all down to D. If D had not made that single observation, the world would have gone very differently. I think Spain probably would have remained the, the chief imperial power. But that's the magic of, he, you know, he's the real Mr. Wizard. You know, that's what science <laughs> can do for you. <laughs> Just knowledge of science. You know, there's that classic, I love that classic, I'm sure everyone's heard this, right? The classic um, Arthur C. Clarke quote. That magic is just science that's, uh, uh, you know, or technology that's sufficiently advanced to be indistinguishable from uh, magic. You know, that magic is really just super advanced science. And that's really what happened here. Dee just had such an advanced knowledge of weather and, and, and science and was able to calculate it that it looked like that he had just called down magic in an act of God to destroy the Spanish fleet. But all that he'd done was just look at which way the wind was blowing. So, yeah. And then, of course, he also synthesized everything that he learned in Europe into his occult ideas. And that was a process that went on over about 20 years of refining his occult thinking until it eventually bore fruit in the angelic sessions. But the core ideas that Dee got from his mentors on the continent at this time were first that there should be a new hermetic religion, a world religion of love based on the hermetic axioms and the hermetic texts. Um, that this was superior to the uh, religious factionalization and infighting. Uh, also, the idea that there was a primal language prior to all human languages, uh, the Ur language. This is what all the magicians and alchemists and Kabbalists had been looking for for a couple centuries. And it was only D only discovered this in as that was Enochian. You know, the angels delivered it to him after his fifth in his when he was in his 50s in the scrying sessions. But uh, to more broadly answer your question, you can find the roots of all of Dee's thinking in his student days, in his early 20s. And the most fascinating thing about that is that he really synthesized all of the big streams of hermetic thought that were around at the time. Dee learned them all, all the, you know, the hermetic thought, Kabbalistic thought, astrological thought, all of this stuff. And D synthesized it into one package in his own intellectual career. And then he fulfilled many of the goals of what people were looking for at this time. He discovered the Ur language. He discovered the, the real Kabbalah or the, the primal magical system underlying all the middling attempts by the Grimoire authors to discover bits of magic. And that, of course, was Enochian magic. That was the angelic system. And then he made large strides towards actualizing the goals of the hermetic tradition, meaning establishing a world in hermetic religion, and also, uh, most importantly, beginning the process of the colonization of the new world, which uh, set in motion the wheels of the Christianization of the planet, and then ultimately the creation of the state of Israel. This was another one of the major goals of the the hermeticists and Kabbalists at the time, because all of these things were seen as pre-apocalyptic necessities. They were things that needed to occur to catalyze the second coming. So 
so that's a bit of a long-winded way to answer your question about about uh, Mercator, but that's the that's the big picture of that period of his of his life. Definitely, man. And I also had notes here that he took ideas from Roger Bacon and uh, Raymond Lowell as well. They really informed his thinking as a young man. And we had talked about the last time we had mentioned uh, Pico della Mirandola, and you know he was really the first person that I could find that did try to synthesize these different belief systems and, and sciences prior to D. And like you were just talking about, D was doing the same thing. You know, I'm curious from what you know, is this syncretic approach? It seems like it was more common among learned people at the time back then than it is now. It doesn't seem like we have a lot of people now that try to synthesize these seemingly disparate philosophies and belief systems. Well, we have more access to information now, which is a big part of it. So, yeah, Pico della Mirandola uh, and Reuchlin synthesized everything. Now, these were, you know, wealthy or, or at least, uh, you know, involved with very wealthy circles in the Medici city-states in the 1400s. And these were the guys that were put in charge, more or less, by the Medici court of synthesizing and making sense of all of the hermetic and occult material and neoplatonic and platonic material that was coming out of those manuscripts brought to the city-states by the Byzantine or, or excuse me orthodox priests that fled the Byzantine empire at, after it fell and yeah they went through and they synthesized hermeticism all of the the hermetic texts and the hermetic axioms the hermetic way of viewing the world like as above so below etc holographic thinking they synthesized that with the Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah, this is important, had not been brought to the Medici city-states by the Orthodox priests, but had come in from the Sephardi Jew, Jewish population, the Sephardic Jews in Spain, brought with them knowledge of, of Kabbalah. Of course, a lot of the big big thinkers, the big rabbinical thinkers in Kabbalah were, were advancing their material around the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, and 14th centuries, I believe, and that's really the time period that what we now know of as Kabbalah stems from. So that knowledge was also brought in by the Jewish community. Um, and then, of course, also the very, you know, a very great tragic period of history. The uh, Sephardic Jewish community had to flee Spain during the Inquisition, where they were put in this terrible position where they were at, at first forced to convert by the Christians in Spain and then after they had converted to Christianity at sword point, the Christians in Spain then decided, oh, well, now they're blending in with Christian society. And now we have to discover who's secretly a Jew or a, a converso was the word for it in, in Spanish. And many Jews became conversos or they, they became under duress. They had to become uh, Christian and then attempted to just get on with their lives and preserve their lives and their families' lives by blending in with Christian Spanish uh, society, but then Spain decided, oh, well, now they're secretly practicing Judaism and blending in. So now we have to find out who's secretly Jewish. And then that was the Inquisition, uh, which was really kind of the run up to the Holocaust. It was just as, you know, or it was in the same continuum of, of horror. And so many of the Sephardic Jews fled Spain and, and some of them came to the city states as well. Knowledge of the Kabbalah came with them. So these things were being synthesized into one big package. And so Mirandola and Reuchlin, Della Mirandola and Reuchlin did a lot of that synthetic work, but then also Trithemius and then Cornelius Agrippa furthered the synthesis because they took all that and then mixed it with the grimoire tradition and folk magic and tried to operationalize it. I say in the book that if you consider Hermeticism and Kabbalah as trying to understand the fundamental operating system of the universe – then operative magic is trying to reprogram it, trying to get in and change the code to your own benefit. Uh, and that's what operative magic was. So Agrippa synthesized all of this stuff into Hermeticism, Kabbalah, and, and operative magic, both from the folk magical traditions of Europe and the Grimoires. And that synthesis really is where we get our modern idea of the occult from. That's the occult as we now know and love it, right? Uh, it was later... A new synthesis was, was later done by McGregor Mathers and the Golden Dawn, uh, but really building on Agrippa's work just with a more material thrown in from things that Agrippa had learned in the, in the British Library and Dee's Enochian tablets. Um, but what I'll argue is that all these things are synthetic. They're mishmashes of information, and they're quite beautiful and in many cases effective in their own right. But Dee was not satisfied with any, any of these syntheses, or at least Agrippa's, 
even Agrippa in his introduction to the three books of uh, Agrippa wrote the three books of philosophy in his 20s and he at least says in his introduction to those books that he has since given up magic that he decided it just didn't work it couldn't get reliable results he came to regard magic as the fruitless pursuit flight of fancy of a young man and he essentially says in his introduction to the three books of occult philosophy well i've grown out of this now he may have been saying that because he didn't want people who found the book to kill him he may have still been engaged in magic i think that's quite likely but that was his attitude on it but d was not not happy with any of this he was not it wasn't enough d wanted to discover the the true source of magic the real source of magic and not create a patchwork approximation of it and that's why he contacted the angels and the angels did deliver him the true system which is a nokian magic the thing the angels say is this is the real you know this is what everyone has played at this is the true system of magic and if you put the enochian material side by side with agrippa the contrast becomes quite clear where Agrippa looks like somebody making their best guess and Enochian, you know, is, is a clear snapshot of how a computer works, you know, uh, as opposed to somebody making their best guess of how a computer might work. So in terms of the, the present day, uh, yes, a new synthesis was created by Mathers folding in Enochian. Crowley then built on that. And this is, this is something that occultists do, right? They seem naturally prone to it to synthesize and pull things from different religious traditions. And this is really good because it's an, it's an anti-dogmatic approach. It's a, it's, a, it's a much more scientific approach. It's saying, well, I'm going to try lots of different things and see what works and what doesn't. And eventually, I think anyone who studies this kind of comes to their own synthesis, their own patchwork approximation of what works for them and what doesn't. Of course, different people have different goals. And the thing about that is, the thing that's so fascinating to, about Enochian for me, though, is it's one big chunk delivered top down instead of human beings trying to synthesize something. And for that reason alone, I think that it bears close and careful study as a complete system of magic without any attempts to cross synthesize it with other things. Uh, you can certainly do that, but I think that taking it as its own thing on its own merits at least initially is quite important and is another reason why i wrote this book because i wanted it to be revealed in the correct historical context instead of you know the context that the golden dawn put it in or or just assumptions about what it is clarity matters uh, but yeah I, i'm not against the synthetic approach i just think we have to draw a clear uh, we have to clearly understand what's a human synthetic effort and what is top down delivered that is Assuming that you actually believe the Enochian system was delivered by angels or, you know, many people might think, well, it just probably came out of Dean Kelly's unconscious, right? Or the session, the psychodrama of the, the sessions themselves or, you know, the third mind between them, as Burroughs and Geisen might have put it, that it emerged from the context of the sessions and that angels are not real. But that's for the individual to determine. It's probably best determined through practice, by the way. You mentioned Trithemius during that explanation there. Let's talk a bit about him and cryptography. I asked you last time about the uh, Steganographia, I don't know if I'm saying that right, which he wrote, and I wanted to circle back to that. You know, that text is three volumes that appear to be about magic that D discovered in uh, Belgium in February 1563. And I wanted to read a passage here from your book, kind of lengthy, so just bear with me. The Steganographia was at least apparently concerned with using spirits for long-distance communication and with sending telepathic messages that could be received within 24 hours, the political importance of which obviously was immense. After precise astrological calculations, an operator was to write a message on a piece of paper and invoke angelic couriers to read the text. A receiver performed a similar ritual and was supposed to receive the contents of the message on their end. Such occult devices were they found in the hands of Catholic fifth columnists or, or even commoners would be grounds for imprisonment, torture, or execution. But in the hands of the state, grimoires became jealously guarded troves of technological secrets. D excitedly wrote of his find to uh, Cecil, who was sufficiently impressed to lend D the support and funds to continue his quest until June 1564. There was only one problem. The steganographia and its occult tables are largely cryptography. In 1606, the text was fully published to the ire of the church, which placed it on its list of prohibited books, where it would remain for three centuries until 1900. And the book was published along with its key to its contents, which revealed the code 
for the first two of its three books, showing that they were not about magic at all. The third book remained encrypted until it was solved by two researchers working independently without knowledge of each other. In 1996, by Thomas Ernst, a professor of German in Pittsburgh, and in 1998, by Jim Reeds, a mathematician at AT AT&T Labs in New Jersey. Both cracked the cipher of the text, demonstrating that the third book is also cryptography masked as tables for angelic summoning. So I apologize for that lengthy passage, but here's the $64,000 question, Jason. Do we have any indication how exactly these cryptographic texts influence D and his work? Because based on this passage here and the nature of this text that apparently fascinated D for at least a year, I mean, is all this Enochian even magic? Or is it just an elaborate cipher waiting to be solved? Because you do present several theories as to what the nature of these channelings and the resulting texts could be, and one of them is cryptography. So how serious should we take this this cryptographic possibility here? Okay, well, here's the deal with this. This is, this is, by the way, why you need somebody who's both, you know, looking at things from the academic and historical position and the occult position to assess things like this. So, the stegon- so yeah, the steganographia... Uh, the book by Trithemius, D was sent to the Netherlands by William Cecil, the Secretary of State, to discover this book, particularly because they wanted the cryptographic codes contained in it. So Steganographia was written by, so Trithemius was, I believe, a either a Benedictine or a Franciscan abbot, I think Benedictine. And it is three books, much of which is concerned, there are lots of tables of spirits, similar to the the key of Solomon, but a different rank and file of spirits, many of which are, they, they claim, will do things like bring messages, carry messages across long distances and that type of thing, which also Cecil was quite interested in. There were, they assumed there might be occult secrets of military significance in the book along with cryptography. D eventually located the book. It was probably the rarest occult book in Europe. It was kind of like a quest for the Necronomicon or something like that. He finally found it in, I think, Utrecht. He was given, I believe, 24 hours to copy it by hand, which he did. And then he spent quite a bit of time working on it in terms of how it influenced D. Oh, and by the way, importantly, Trithemius was the teacher of Cornelius Agrippa. So a lot of Trithemius' work shows up in Agrippa as well. Okay, that that aside, D spent a lot of time working on the steganographia. It undoubtedly gave him a lot of cryptographic information. It allowed him to make advanced uh, cryptographic efforts uh, for England, for England spying efforts. Uh, so they definitely got what they wanted in terms of cryptog- cryptography. Now, the question of was the steganographia specifically just a book on cryptography disguised as a book about magic? Okay, so it's been argued that this was this was the case that that it was he had described he had disguised it as a book on magic so that if it was discovered by enemy uh, agents or people who thought you know if people discovered it and realized he was a spy that he would have been killed so he was pr- covering himself by disguising it as a book on magic. Now this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because he could have also been killed for being discovered having a book on magic. So that doesn't really make sense. So there's an occult writer slash troll named Joel Barocco, who was uh, infamous in the 1980s for writing a zine called Chaos with a K. And uh, he's still around. He was kind of one of these guys that just would come out of the woodwork from time to time and say, nobody knows what, what chaos magic is except me. And then people would ask him, well, what's chaos magic? And then he would refuse to tell them. <laughs> and, and Joel, I've known for quite a while, he, uh, he did his best to troll me actually in the early 2000s when I was first getting started in, uh, in the occult world. He's kind of, he was an infamous dude at the time. Anyways, he wrote in one of the chaos zines in Chaos 14 that he, he suspected that what the steganographia actually was, it was occult material dis- disguised as cryptographic material, disguised as occult material. Meaning that you have an occult book, you decode the occult layer, and you discover that it's cryptography, but then you decode the cryptography, and you, un- you find a third layer underneath that's the true occult material. Um, I think that's at least a fascinating suggestion. Um, of course, here's the thing, right? That book was, the cipher on the steganographia was not broken until the 1990s. This made international news, 
and it was decided, oh, we've discovered that it's just cryptography, so it can't be a book on magic. After all, it's just cryptography. Well, I'm sorry. Anyone who has spent any amount of time with people who are seriously engaged in the occult knows that occultists are all interested in cryptography, right? I think that uh, occult people are almost invariably interested in secret codes, secret alphabets, secret writing, Kabbalah, gematria, substitution of one character set for the other, numerology. Codes are a big part of magic. Secret writing is a huge part of magic, even down to the sigil method. I mean, you can you can consider creating a sigil is like encrypting something so that your conscious mind can't read it, but your unconscious can. Magic and cryptography go hand in hand. So to say, I think that if somebody says, well, we've discovered that there's cryptography in this book, therefore there can't be any magic, simply betrays that the person making that statement has no understanding of magic and has never been exposed to it in any real way and just doesn't doesn't has no understanding of the context. So the idea that these things are mutually exclusive has to just be false, in my opinion. Things can certainly contain magic and cryptography at the same time. Most magic books contain some type of cryptography. And I think the same goes for D. So a lot of people have argued, well, D was involved in intelligence work. So therefore, what the Enochian sessions, they look at the Enochian tables and they see long strings of letters and codes and numbers and things like that. And they say, well, you know, what if... D and Kelly were just relaying encoded messages and masking it as occult sessions. Now, this is certainly a, you know, a valid theory that very likely could have happened. That follows that someone would have that theory. But again, just because somebody you know, has cryptography in their magical records doesn't mean that it's all just cryptography. It's not just. Nothing is just anything. You know, Things in the real world coexist with each other in remarkable levels of complexity and, and messiness. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there was if there wasn't cryptography in the the Enochian sessions. But when you read the spirit diaries, you know, they (laughs) let's put it this way. If they were hiding cryptography, they were hiding cryptography in thousands of pages or hundreds of pages of biblical prose, unbelievably um, beautiful and in many cases shocking and in many cases personally embarrassing episodes of their writing of their revelations during the angelic sessions you know, writing stuff in, in, um, and, and talking about, you know, Kelly's mental breakdowns, D's personal trials of faith. And, you know, so if they were hiding codes, they were hiding it in one of the most profound pieces of mystic literature in world history, certainly in the English language. So when we study the occult, I think it's very tempting sometimes for people to say, oh, this is just this. One of the f- things that I say in my first book in Generation Hex is that when you're studying magic in the occult, it's very tempting, but you must ne- it's very tempting to do this, but you must never do it. And that is to make a one-to-one correspondence between things, to say this is that. At any time in the occult, when if you say, for instance, oh, well, the sun, you know, Mithras is a solar god, therefore Mithras is just a symbol of the sun. Mithras is a, it's a one-to-one correspondence. Mithras equals sun, and there's no difference. That's a that's a mistake. You're you're falling into the pit of because, as they say. Uh, so we must never make a one to one correspondence between things because in the world of magic, things are analogical. They're changing, meaning shifts. Things can mean lots of things. There can be layers of meaning. You can't read magical texts unless you're able to read them on many many layers of interpretation. That's how magical texts work. Even just to read it in plain English. You know, there's the, the literal interpretation, the metaphorical interpretation, the initiated interpretation, the Kabbalistic interpretation. In the world of magic, things shift, meanings shift, and, and meanings can be as messy as the world itself because people who are engaged in magic are trying to represent faithfully the world as it actually is. And so anytime we see people making these statements like, oh, there's cryptography in it, therefore it must just be a cryptography It simply betrays their lack of imagination and understanding and not the depth of the text. That's my feeling on it. That's a fair answer because like even if it is cryptography, the cipher, the code has to has to mean something, right? Like it's not just it doesn't just stop there. Like you don't just say, Oh, it's a code, we solved it, that's the end of it. Like, well, what does the code mean then? So Right. Yeah. Yeah. And even even in the spirit diaries, there's so many you know, it's a it's a semiotician's dream. You know, or an occultist dream reading these diaries, 
because they're filled, you know, D will write in Greek, he'll write in Latin. There's a little bit of Hebrew, you know, and there's math in it. And then Enochian, there's so many layers of different codes and languages and Crowley is the same. Crowley is full of so many layers of significance and densely packed Kabbalistic meaning. And these documents, look, these documents are written in twilight language. You know, the, the idea that, you know, initiates write in twilight language, things that will make sense to those who are initiated, but seem like gibberish to those who are not. And it's quite effective, I have to say. While I was researching this book, I went to England to go to the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians had an exhibit on uh, lots of D's library was put up for exhibit. And it was fascinating to watch this because here, you know, we have these one of the most incredibly rigorous academics, people with doctorates, multiple doctorates, observing this material and coming to conclusions about it. And they simply put it on display. And then even then, with these magic, they wouldn't touch it. And they, and they said, oh, and then there was this magic thing, but we don't like to talk about it. He was probably just deluded by Kelly, who was a fraud. And we all make mistakes. That was kind of their attitude on D's magic. Well, look, this is how I feel about this. If that's your personal view, if your personal view of reality is that magic is not real, that's great. That's wonderful. You know, please. I think that in our modern world, quite frankly, if everyone started believing in magic and these levels of reality, it would be a disaster. Because I think that the thing that people need most right now, I mean, particularly in, in America where I live, <laughs> you know, is, is science and scientific education and pure reason. I mean, America is sliding backwards into, not to digress, but America is sliding back into the dark ages into the medieval period, even all the way up to the highest office in the land. And so the most important thing, practically speaking, is for people to be solidly grounded in scientific rationalism and materialism. We need more of that, please, please. So it would be a disaster if everyone in the world was to think like you and I and the people listening. Now, that doesn't mean that our way of thinking is invalid. It's quite important and quite necessary to society in many, in many senses. But this is how I feel about it. If you're examining somebody like D as a historian or an academic and you do not personally believe in magic or think it's valid, that's fine and that's wonderful and that's perhaps as it should be. However, it's simply intellectually dishonest and disingenuous to therefore discount that entire side of not just D but that period of history. When we write about things and examine things, we have to be very careful not to project our own prejudices onto them because those prejudices simply aren't relevant to that time period. They will simply occlude or cover up whole parts of people's thinking and result in a lack of a loss of understanding and a, lot, and a lack of understanding of what these things really were, which again is, is one of the primary reasons I wrote this book because I was so frustrated reading all of these academic writers and biographers writing about D and then not taking his magic seriously and then reading occult writers writing about D's magic, but only D's magic. These things had to be put back together. They had to be reassembled into a whole, which for me was like splitting the atom in reverse because it put the world, the narrative of the, of the world back together and revealed what history has actually been. But I digress. I think that it's kind of the same with people talking about the codes and, and I just have to reiterate that just because we don't understand it doesn't mean there's not something there to understand. I mean, have a little hubris, for God's sake. You know, you, we have to take, at least, take it at least as a possibility that people might have known more than us. Certain people might know more than us now. It's the height of arrogance to think that just because we're modern people that therefore we're more intelligent or intellectually advanced than people who lived 400 years ago. It might be quite the, the opposite. We've given away so many of our intellectual faculties and our ability to think to technology and outsourced it to media and things like that, 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 you know, by and large, we don't learn Latin, we don't learn Greek, we don't learn the ability to think for ourselves even in our educational system. We're, we're incredibly poor educationally in the modern world outside of people with, you know, very, very high tier educations. But and I, it just boggles my mind, not to go on a rant, but it truly does. It's like we take somebody like D, and this is a true Renaissance man on the level of a da Vinci, you know, one of the perhaps the smartest man of his age. 
and we look at him and we say, oh, well, we don't understand what he was talking about. Therefore, it must be delusion. You think that's the truth? I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think so. I think it's simply just ar- it's arrogance on our part. How dare we? If you have to, if you study somebody like D, take, you know, study him on his own terms, you know, st- I, in writing this book, it was a, a struggle for me just to get myself to a place where I could even begin to understand what D was talking about. But it was a struggle that I had to make, I had to make and a battle that I had to fight. I had to learn. I had to put myself at least in the position where I could be a student of D so that I could feel like I was sitting in uh, his class writing this book. That's how I felt. You know, it's like I felt I needed to at least make myself worthy to sit in a the astral classroom, as it were. You know, I don't mean literally, but in the sense of metaphorically to sit in Dee's classroom and at least be able to hear what he was saying and take clear notes and summarize it so that other people could understand it and begin to, you know, so there could be class notes, right? So that people could begin to understand Dee on his own terms. And, and nobody has done that in that way, or not many people. People certainly have done it. But anyways, that's, that's a bit of a tangent on that. But I think this applies also to the occult in general. I think that particularly now in the occult world, people are far too fast to become reductionist about things, to say, you know, usually the thing that they do is either they'll say, A, it's all archetypes, it's all Jungian archetypes, and it all means the same thing, which infuriates me. And then the other thing that they say is, oh, well, you know, post chaos magic. Oh, you don't need to learn all this stuff, Kabbalah, Gematria, all that. It's just a language for talking to your unconscious. Just do sigils and chaos magic and you can make it up. Well, I'm sorry. That's like saying you can make up physics, right? And it'll work just as good. You know, you might be able to throw a rock over a fence, but you will not be able to make a a jet thruster, you know, just make it up, reinvent the wheel and make it up as you go along. It's another reason why I wrote this book that people need to understand the, the occult was a branch of the sciences. It was a branch of the Western intellectual tradition, and it was not separate from all the other sciences. Magic was a specific science, and it is a specific science that we are in the process of resurrecting. And so it infuriates me when people try to deconstruct it or come at it, at it with a sword or destroy it or remake it in their own image or say – oh, Kabbalah is nonsense, there's nothing, you know, Kabbalah is pointless, you know, just worship evil spirits or whatever it is. You know, it infuriates me because there is an actual science here and just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not important and it doesn't have to be learned. When I was first learning magic in the late 90s, when I first came across the occult, the, the prevailing trend at that time was, of course, chaos magic and in in studying for studying and then meeting other people and interacting on early internet forums, the thing that everyone was saying was, oh, you know, you don't need to learn Kabbalah. You don't need to learn Hermeticism. You don't need to learn Gamatria. That's all, that's all hogwash. That's all from the myths of history. You know, make it up as you go along. Do sigils. Do that type of thing. Take the chaos magic approach. And that never sat well with me. And so my act of chaotic rebellion, if, if you will, was to say, well, I, weren't, I will learn all that. But what if I do? What will happen then? And it was fascinating to see that nobody else had even bothered to even begin learning it. You know, I'm amazed how rarely I will meet an occultist who even knows Hebrew. You know, the most very basic step of learning Kabbalah or Western magic. You know, it, it, that, this, this shocks me and, and the level of revulsion they have for Kabbalah as if it was whatever, you know, and I, but I, and, and, or simply the revulsion for the idea of ascent, you know, the idea of that there are higher beings that may know more than us, the idea that ethics and morality and good should be part of magic. This is anathema to people. It's much easier for them to slide into the gutter and just start focusing on Goetia and, and things like that. The idea that perhaps uh, one has to be purified to do magic through long, hard suffering and trial, this is anathema to people. And it unfortunately simply, again, displays that people see the bar and they would rather lower lower the bar than train themselves to jump over it. I think it's that simple, but you don't learn to fly like an angel without learning to at least jump over the bar to make a really <laughs> weird 
dad metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I'll spare you. I can keep going, but I'll spare you my rant. I think that you get, <laughs> that's, you get that's totally idea, cool, man. I want people to understand there is a true Western esoteric tradition and to re- res- respect what's there instead of trying to change it. Well, that's completely fair, man. I want to make sure I, I get to these questions because I, I asked some patrons on Patreon to submit some questions and they did. So I actually have a series of questions here from Jeff. He's one of the patrons. He was wondering if you could reveal some more specifics about how D system is actually used in practice. He says that you keep alluding in podcasts to how powerful D system is compared to other systems. Do you have any real world examples from your own practice? I've got tons. There are some in Ultra Culture Journal, one of my earlier books. But one of the things that I've, one of the conclusions that I've come to is it would certainly be very salacious and exciting and enlightening to share some of my personal experiences with, with Enochian. But I'm a little hesitant to do that for a couple of reasons. One is, frankly, just because it's personal, you know. Uh, but the second one is I don't like to pre game people if you were, you know, like it's it's easy to when you hear other people's experiences, then you you unconsciously think that that's what the experience is. And then when you actually do it, it will conform to what you've already heard about it to some extent, although not totally. I think if people want to experience Enochian, it's quite simple to start working your way through the calls and see what you experience. Do the 30th Enochian, call the 30th Enochian either, uh, and you can get uh, Lon Duquette's book, Enochian Vision Magic, for great information on how to do that. It's extremely easy and straightforward. You don't need to build all the equipment, at least not initially. But I'll say this. Enochian magic radically changes the substrate of reality. It changes the substrate of your personality. So what do I mean by that? So right now you're you're listening to this podcast, and I don't know where you are. Dear listener, you might be sitting in your room, you might be driving, you might be doing dishes, whatever it happens to be. And all around you, you have a life that is made up of all of the past decisions you have made. It's been made up of everything that you think you are. It's a story about who you are and what the world is concretized into flesh and, and stone, right? That's your life. All of this is, is built up on the substrate of your identity. So uh, all the physical, all the things around you physically are the result of the decisions you have made and the decisions that your ancestors have made and all the way down to your physical body. Those decisions rest on certain stories you have about what the world is, who you are, what is valuable, what you're choosing to focus on in life, uh, what your options for the future are, what your story about your past is. All that's in your head. And all of that, all those stories rely on and rest on the substrate and the bedrock of the fundamental nature of your consciousness itself uh, and its condition qualities. Now, When you do something like Enochian magic, you radically change the substrate of your consciousness. What I mean by that is you will get incredible influxes if you do it correctly and humbly. Enochian opens you up to tremendous wisdom and understanding of what the universe really is and who you really are. You cannot do that without radically changing the substrate of your consciousness. Now, this is the same way that the substrate of your consciousness would be changed, for instance, by, let's say, meditating for 10, 20, 30 years. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that would look at a Buddhist monk who's been meditating for 30 years and say, oh, that's not real, right? Oh, they're just meditating. That's just in their head. You know, somebody who's been been meditating for 30 years is going to be a radically different person than somebody who, you know, who's simply just been playing, I don't know, Nintendo DS for their whole life, right? It's going to be a radically different person than, and it's going to be a radically different person than the average Western consumer and worker, right? Radically different all the way down to, you know, they've done MRI scans of experienced meditators, Buddhist monks, Tibetan monks, things like that, and shown that their actual brains are different. You know, the the how their the electromagnetic waves in their brain move are different and things like that different parts are built up even stronger i don't know enough neuroscience to give you specific language on that but this is what they've demonstrated 
So I don't think anyone in the world would look at a Buddhist monk who's been meditating for 30 years and say, nothing has happened. That's not real. Oh, they're incredibly peaceful and conscious and present and engage with what truly matters in life and the compassion and caring for all beings. Oh, that's not real. No one, not even the most diehearted secular materialist would say such a thing. Now, if you're doing something like Enochian magic, quite likely what you're doing is condensing that amount of shift in consciousness into a very, very short period of time. This is what Enochian does. So instead of 20 years, 30 years, you're doing it in a few months or a year. Not enough to actually change your brain, of course, because that has to come with long practice, but certainly to radically shift your consciousness and your reference point on rea what reality, reality is and what yourself is. So if you change the substrate that your whole life is built up on, so all of those decisions you've made, all of those beliefs and those stories you have about your life, it's like an earthquake. If you shake the substrate, if you shake the ground, everything else, all the buildings you have built up on top of that ground will topple and crumble and fall to the ground. It couldn't be any other way. And if you meditate for 20 or 30 years, it's done very, very slowly. So that happens in a, in a sustainable and non-dramatic way. Uh, if you do something like Enochian and calling the Aethers, particularly over a short period of time, you just shift your substrate into something else completely and your life will fall apart at least in some sense, because it couldn't be any other way. The buildings, the stories you've told yourself, the, the buildings of belief and decision that you have create your life will tumble into dust, just like the tower card from the tarot. Of course, of course, because they're illusions. They're built on illusion. They're built on shifting sand. And when you shake the ground, they crumble. So an, many people say Enochian is apocalyptic. Well, you're damn right it's apocalyptic. It'll destroy what you think your life is. But what could be better? You know, you're afraid of this? Well, man up, <laughs> woman up, <laughs> any, yeah. any, you know, gender up, any, any, any gender configuration, but just chin up, you know, if you're interested, if you're not, then don't, if you, if, if that doesn't sound good, then don't start. But if you're going to start, then finish, because uh, that's what we're dealing with, with Enochian. And I hope that gives a, a good general view of what it does without giving you specifics of my experiences, because by the way, it's different for everyone. Everyone's got a different nervous system. They have different metaphors for thinking about and interacting with reality. Crowley's experiences were very different from Dee and Kelly's and are very different from mine, from very different from other people who have done Enochian. It's quite personal and quite individualized to the person undertaking the work. But I think that as long as you do it sincerely and with humility and with reverence, then you will get results. And reverence, of course, is a word used in the book The Cloud of Unknowing, the Christian prayer manual from the Middle Ages. Reverence means a combination of love and fear. This is the correct attitude to approach the divine with because the divine is all-knowing and all-loving. But by God, it will beat your ass. <laughs> Not vindictively, <laughs> yeah. but because people create illusions. Their whole lives are illusions they've created. This is why in Hinduism, Shiva the destroyer, right? Shiva opens his third eye and destroys the universe. Why? Because it's, it's a game. It's a game of children. It's an illusion. And it's not an illusion that we've, we're stuck in. This is the mistake that the Gnostics make. The Gnostics think that we're trapped in the black iron prison and the matrix and all that other nonsense. No, we're, we're trapped in an, in, illusion, in an illusion of our own making. We chose this illusion. And for that reason, it's far more pernicious than even the Gnostics thought. Because the Gnostics, if it was as simple as, oh, the evil archons built this universe and this co prison for consciousness and all we have to do is find the archons and kill them and everything will be fine, well, that would be quite easy, wouldn't it? But it's not. It's much more pernicious than that because we are the archons. We are the demiurge. We are the false god, the creator of our own existence. And, and therefore, to overcome that is, is a Herculean task. Because it requires us to relinquish the illusions that we built to protect ourselves in the first place. So how do you interface with the language itself, this Sinachian language? Do you read it? Do you speak it? Is it spoken to you in visions? Like, I'm curious of your level of interaction with the language itself. Uh, all of the above, but the practically speaking, you pretty much read it off the page, you know, just like in Hollywood. 
So is it pretty easy to learn then? Would you recommend it to somebody who's a, a novice or would you need somebody that's more experienced? Well, it's not really like you learn it like it's a language, uh, like you're becoming fluent and conversational in it. It's more that it's the language in which the Enochian incantations and calls are written that you then recite similar to reciting mantras or something like that. Okay, that's fair. I wanted to mention, too, before we go here, the the logo for the podcast. I think you've seen it at this point, but it's based off of Dee's Sigillum de Amoth. So how was that created exactly, and what was it used for? So the Sigillum actually first appears in Liber Geratus, which is a, a grimoire that predates D, but it was corrected by the angels in, in actually some of the first angelic sessions in the Five Books of Mystery, I believe in Liber Secundus, but I could be might be Liber Tertius. I think it's Liber Secundus. It's delivered by the Archangel Michael to D and Kelly. And it's, it's a map of the, the seven planetary energies, I think, is probably. It's, it's a map of the seven planets uh, along seven scales of manifestation. So seven by seven. And of course, contains the seal of Babylon. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Tracy Twyman. Uh, she's a former guest here and She's been writing and saying a lot recently that she believes John G to be the demiurge who helped create this modern world we live in. And I think you'd agree with that, obviously, based on your book here. But she takes it a little further and she really paints D as this nefarious figure who took it upon himself to construct, I guess, what she sees as a, a sort of hellish alchemical dystopia. So help me grok this. I know in the book you're pretty neutral on D as you should be. But is he trying to do something to benefit humanity? Is he a divine light that guides the way? Or is he a uh, this evil black mage who's brought hell to earth, who's trying to fulfill some sort of apocalyptic prophecy? Or is it one and the same? Is it somewhere in between? Where do you stand on D and his work and what the true intent of it is or was? Well, my viewpoint is only as good as one person's viewpoint. There's There's... 7 billion viewpoints and growing on this planet and those viewpoints shift from second to second. So I, I resist, you know, the idea that there's objective truth on these things is, it's just not possible, right? There is no objective truth in the sense that truth. And what I mean by that is that truth is not only subjective to the individual, but it depends on what your reference points are. So is D bad in comparison to what? In comparison to what? You know, I'll just ask that question, right? Is he, is he bad in comparison to the wealth of the British Empire from the years 1580 to 1900, let's say? Well, absolutely not. He's practically the Messiah of England. Is he bad in, in regards to the 19 million Bengali uh, individuals who starved to death in the famines induced by the British Empire in England in the 19th century. Well, if he's the founder, if he's responsible for the British Empire, then he's quite evil, right? But who's to say, right? The world, the universe doesn't quite work like that. It's the universe is is infinite and and constantly shifting, and there is no master narrative. So, and this is where I have to take the long view on things instead of a look at things conspiratorially and certainly to, to look at things moralistically like that is simply not sophisticated enough in my opinion because you can always ask that question and this is something useful you can always ask in your own life also measured by what you know measured by what so let's say even in your own life you're walking through the day and you start thinking bad thoughts oh well man, I'm not very successful. Like, or you start telling yourself that you're not successful or you're, you're, you're falling short in some area in your life. Well, compared to what? Compared to what? Right? Interrupt the thought. Compared to what? Compared to David Beckham? Compared to the Queen of England? Or compared to somebody who makes 10 cents a day making hand towels in Bangladesh or something like that? You know, compared to what? So we, and we have to be quite consciously remember that we do live in a quantum universe and we do live in a, a, a world of complex, a universe of complexity and chaos in which our viewpoint is only as good as any others of which there are infinite ones, which I think Crowley lays out quite well in the book of the law. Nuit, Hadit, and Rahu Akwit, you know, Nuit being the, in, the infinite field of possibilities and Hadit being the infinite number of potential viewpoints within that infinite field. 
that's how I think we need to begin to see the world in, you know, with new Aeon type thinking. Now that said, um, is D the demiurge? Well, D is a demiurge, but aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's all part of us, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. But okay, but to bring this more down to earth and answer this directly, D in his life was a profoundly devout man. I don't think that man had a sinister or nefarious bone in his body. I think that he was quite naive in many ways in who he trusted and perhaps in how his ideas would be used and received. But he's no different than, say, Tesla or or somebody like that or, or these great geniuses whose ideas were used for things that were not what they intended. D had two overwhelming goals in his life. His goal was to know God and to come to a true knowledge of God. And his other goal was the success of England. He was a patriot to the end and the the success of his homeland. And he turned down many, many opportunities where he was offered, especially in his early 20s, many times to go work for foreign powers for large sums of money. And he turned them all down to work for his home country because he was a patriot to the end. And he was never thanked for that. He was tortured for it. He was not paid for it. He dwelled in poverty for it for his whole life. But he he was a patriot to the end. And also, I think there's a, a great moment that really reveals Dee's character in the Spirit Diaries. And I don't remember, hopefully I didn't already say this on your podcast, but there's a moment where Kelly reaches a peak of frustration. And Kelly says, I think it's three or four years into the Spirit Sessions. And during those three or four years, all that has been happening is the angels have been transmitting the schematics for the, the furniture and the Indochian language to them. And it's painstaking work. It's like copying bank statements. And Kelly says, and there's no real clear purpose as to why they're doing it or what, are, what it's all leading up to. And Kelly says, look, if we had spent the last few years doing anything but this, you know, I could have mastered the seven basic sciences. We could have mastered alchemy. We could have done any some, some economic effort to become rich if we put in this amount of intellectual work and effort into anything but this. We could have been doing incredibly, but instead we're practically starving. And Dee's wife is constantly at his throat. There's no food for the children. There's no money. Your, your kids are going hungry. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And Dee turns around and he says to Kelly, if I were to give up everything, my health, my life, my money, and have nothing, my fame, my reputation, and have nothing but a robe to walk in and a, a, a walking stick to carry me and a bowl to beg with. And if I were to spend my days doing nothing but going up and down the length of England begging for my food, if it would get me closer to God and closer to the angels, I would do it without a second's hesitation. That's D. That's D's character. And I think that's probably why he got so far as, as he did. So I think that to, to look at D uh, as a nefarious character is simply wrong. Now, if we're to gauge the effect of his ideas on the world, well, that's a very different story. But then we would also have to hold Christ to the same standard. Christ came to earth and simply told us to love each other as love your brother as yourself, meaning we are one being, we are one consciousness. And look how his ideas have been used. So we have to be, we have to be very careful and precise with language, both in what we're measuring by and then what we're actually looking at on what timeline. But, Hopefully, I've given at least a, a window into Dee's individual character because this is a point of contention that people bring up a lot, of course. But it's something that people bring up with magic a lot where people are still, even in the 21st century, still quite superstitious and scared of magic and uh, in the, have the fear in the back of their head that, oh, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's all evil and delusion and demonic in some way, even if they're supposedly scientific and rational people. People still have a fear of magic, and, and they'll often hold up things like, oh, well, Dee died in poverty, or look, what, look how you know, Crowley died in poverty, things like this uh, as examples. But we have to be very, very precise in how we use language and, and, and think about causation and correlation. Are we looking at causation or correlation? Did Dee have a very hard life? Yes. Did he, he lose his, his family to the plague? Yes. Now, did he raise as high as he, he could have in English society? Given his class background and his profession, yes, he did. England is a, is a strict class society. 
It's not like he, you know, was going to raise higher than he was. And okay, so D had all these hard things in his life. Was there anyone else in England that was having a better time of things? No, <laughs> including Elizabeth. And uh, for instance, people say, oh, well, D died in debt, things like this. Well, look, Sir Francis Walsingham, the guy who started the English Secret Services, what we now know as MI5 and MI6, D's friend and contemporary, Walsingham died broke also. Walsingham had to finance the creation of the British intelligence services out of his own pocket. Why? Because Elizabeth's court was broke. And it was, Elizabeth's court was broke and English was an impoverished country, by the way, until they executed Dee's plans and colonized the New World. So Dee, quite in contravention to being some type of icon of poverty, was the one who raised his country out of poverty, creating the greatest empire the world has ever known, for better or for worse. So that's all I have to say about, about that. And we just have to, be, we have to be clear about the questions we ask, what angle we're asking them from, and what we mean by them. Well, I asked that because I heard you say on a couple other interviews that you were not a conspiracy theorist. So I just wanted to, you know, get you to talk more about that because I think, yeah, it's a common opinion that the uh, and the creation of the British Empire was, you know, a nefarious deed, so to speak. So, okay, but here, here's another point on this, right? Name me one thing in the world, including every human individual, that is not most both good and evil, right? And by the way, good and evil are, of course, human concepts and human abstractions. But everything, you know, this is a point that Crowley makes so clearly. Everything in the world, it, everything has to become dual to manifest. Only things above the abyss are pure, right? And the, the only, and by pure, it means they're reconciled with their opposite. Everything in the world, the world is polarized. So it means that everything in existence has to partake of dualism uh, just to manifest, because uh, if something was a, if some, something was a perfectly reconciled, perfectly balanced equation, it would no longer exist. The equations would all balance to zero. If that, I mean, that's kind of a metaphorical way of looking at it. But the world's a messy place, right? It doesn't conform to human ideas of how things should be. And this is an incredibly important point for magic. If you approach magic trying to make the world conform to the ideas in your head of how you think it should be, you're gonna have a hard time. It's not going to go well for you because that's not how the universe works. The universe works the way the universe works, which is, by the way, a lot better than how human beings think it works, right? It's only the patterns in our own head when we try to impose them upon the, the creative chaos of existence uh, and then we discover they're not real. Then we, come dis we become disillusioned. Many people come to magic and become disillusioned with magic. Thank God. Thank God, because that's what magic's for. Magic is there to disillusion you, to take your illusions away, that you can control the world, that you can impose your patterns on it, your, your thinking, that you can impose a story or a mythology. How horrific would the world be if everyone could just impose the story of the Old Testament on the world or the New Testament or name your religious text? You know, even the Bhagavad Gita, something like that, you know, or Star Wars, right? Whatever it happens to be. If human beings could really impose their views of how the world should be on the world, the world would be hell, but it's not. So we have to, we have to recognize our limitations, both in understanding and in being able to control the world, which is, I think, one of the great gifts of the magical path, because it shows you that the universe is inherently magical. The universe is the magic. It's there. It's right in front of your face. And it's only because we're trying to control it and we think it should be something that it's not that we become disappointed with it. But if we were simply to stop and notice where we were and what the universe was and flow to its rules instead of ours, how much more would life open up and become a place of joy and wonderment and unceasing amazement? A hey, fucking men. So, hey, remind people where they can find you in the book. Yeah. So the best place to find me is jasonlouv.com. I've got everything there, including this book, all my books. My courses on magic, magic.me, which are being expanded greatly at the moment. Uh, all my social media is there. So yeah, jasonlouv.com. You can find the book there or you can find it on Amazon. Just Google uh, or search John D. and the Empire of Angels on, on Amazon. You'll find it. Uh, but yeah, jasonlouv.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at jasonlouv. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for the time. I really do appreciate you coming back uh, for a sequel here. And I look forward to talking to you again down the line, hopefully. Me too. Thanks for having me back. 
And there you have it, my thanks again to Jason Louv. If you are one of the six people who listens to this show and have not read Empire of Angels yet, it's definitely worth your time. This one was quite different than the first chat. I thought Jason seemed a bit contentious there toward the end, which didn't bother me, but it definitely gave this track a bit of a different vibe than the other. That said, I thought Jason's idea of unlocking or tapping into substrate consciousness through Anakia magic was a hot, hot take. I've become familiar with that term recently, the substrate, because of some recent conversations with a Buddhist friend of mine, shout out to Mike, and this idea of gaining access to that substrate level of consciousness is, from what I know, that's a Buddhist idea, and Jason has spent plenty of time immersed in that school of thought, so it's not surprising to see him sort of meld these two things together, doing some syncretism of his own, perhaps. And I could be wrong, that could not be a Buddhist idea, but that's just my only frame of reference for the term. And who knows, maybe there's more in common with these seemingly disparate belief systems than we realize. It seems like a lot of modern occult and esoteric philosophy does have eastern roots. Regardless of where it comes from, though, I'm still of the opinion that my magical energy is better spent elsewhere. Anyway, no Patreon extension this time around due to time constraints, but I do have some Patreon news for prospective and current patrons I am in the early stages of putting together a patron book club and also, possibly, a patron writers group open to all tiers regardless of your contribution level. So if you want to get in on the ground floor before that begins, just two bucks a month will get you access to that when it starts, plus exclusive bonus content, discounted merchandise at our official web store, access to a patron-only Discord channel, all my old podcasts that I recorded for the 45-minute radio hour, And the further up you go in the tiers, the more you get, including access to our raw episodes, monthly giveaways, submit questions to our guests, free merchandise, access to our group movie night, and chances to co-host an episode, throw in the book club, throw in a potential peer writing group, and we are well on our way to building a nice little community here. It's not a cult, I swear. Or maybe it is. Who cares? If any of this strikes your magical fancy, head up patreon.com slash occulture and join fine folks such as Jean-Paul, Hawk, Tanisha, Adrian, Thomas, Eric, Oliver, Jay, Kale, Julie, and Queen Pleb, who all signed up last week at the 2 or $5 levels. Or if you're feeling frisky, you can join Timothy, who became an official executive producer of the show by contributing at the $10 level. Again, that's patreon.com slash occulture. One more thing, our Fall Equinox sale is ongoing at oculturepodcast.com slash merch. So if you're a non-patron and want a discount on some new tees or tanks or crop tops or hoodies or hats, use code Equinox to get 10% off all orders through Sunday, September 23rd. Longest sale ever. Anyway, that's all my plugs for this week, which means my time is up for now. So until next time, you've just been initiated into Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you, to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.